to another edition of the Black Knitter Knitting Podcast. I'm Liz, the Black Knitter, and welcome, welcome. Um, If you've been here before, I'm glad you came back. Um, If this is your first time here, I'm glad you found us, and I hope that you will come back again and again. Um, This is a channel all about, um, we talk about race uh, in the making community um and we talk about black and brown makers um with a focus on black makers um i want people to um learn about all of the black and brown makers that um i've uh, found in, in my search um and i also want to create um a community of Uh, beloved community um, where we can all um, talk about um, race, educate each other about how race impacts lived experience. Um, And um, so if you're interested in being a part of building beloved community, you are for sure in the right place. Um, so welcome. Um, and if you haven't done so already, um, if you want to help grow this community, uh, subscribe, like, and comment, um, that, uh, helps, uh, this podcast get promoted so that other people can find it. So, um, I appreciate that support. Um, all right. So, um, let me start off with some Habari Ghani. What's the news? What's been happening um, since the last time uh, I did an episode? I think this is episode 13. I'll have to check, but I think it's episode 13. Um, So what's been happening since the last time, which was right before Juneteenth? So it's been about a month. Yeah, it's been about a month. I've been busy, (laughs) y'all. Um, a little too busy and I'm probably going to get even busier, but, um, that's neither here nor there. (laughs) Um, so I'll start with an update on Nico. He's actually in the other room sleeping. Um, I didn't want to wake him up, but he is doing well. He had a vet appointment on Thursday. Today is Sunday and he is still doing really well, um, the vet said he is amazing um, and um, he's maintaining his weight, which is good. He's still eating uh, really well. Um, every time he goes, which is about once a month now, he gets a, a vitamin B12 shot. that kind of helps uh, stimulate his appetite and um, gives him a little bit of energy. Um, So, um, but you know, everything else is fine. His kidney function seems to be pretty stable right now. So that's, um, really good. Um, and they also, uh, confirmed while he was there that he is the smallest dog that they have in the practice, um, which I think is pretty, uh, cool. Um, but if you're, um, in the Akron area, the, the vet that I use is uh, Mike Andrews at Talmadge Animal Hospital. Dr. Mike and the staff are just really, really great. Um, so, you know, if you need a vet, um, they're definitely um, a great place. Dr. Mike has a lot of experience. He's been in practice for a very, very long time, more than 40 years. So um, he just... Um, it, there's no replacement for um, experience, for sure. Um, so I am really um, thankful for, for that experience. So um, I, I know that in addition to the excellent veterinary care that he is receiving, that um, many of you have been praying for Nico um, and me. <laughs> and I so appreciate that. And I know that prayer works. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I will continue to accept, uh, your prayers. Um, I really, really appreciate that. Um, I was back in Baltimore at the end of June. 
um, because I had a conference for work. Um, I didn't really get to do any yarny stuff while I was there. Um, I actually traveled with a colleague, um, so I couldn't like stop anywhere on the way in or the way out of Baltimore. Um, I did get to eat at some nice restaurants. I got to have dinner with my cousin, Tim. Hey, Tim. I know he watches the uh, podcast, so um, it was nice to see him and hang out um, at the Inner Harbor for a little bit. Um, the conference was fine. You know, it was work. Um, but, um, you know, it had been a while since I got to the Inner Harbor. Um, so that was nice to do. Um, what else? The second grant that I was working on got submitted. Um, and we should actually hear about the first grant that I wrote uh, next week. At least that's what they tell us. It's a Department of Education grant. It's a TRIO grant um, for the McNair program. Um, we've had that grant for more than 20 years. Um, so I anticipate that, that we will be renewed for another five years. So fingers crossed, prayers appreciate. <laughs> That'll be something that will be off of my mind once we hear about um, that. The other grant that we submitted it's a trio training grant. Um, it's the first time we wrote for that. So, um, and the funding for that is pretty limited. I'm not convinced. I'm not real confident that we're going to get that one. Um, and if we don't, it's not a big deal, but the McNair one is, is the one that makes me, you know, a little nervous, um, because we have staff <laughs> in that program. So, um, hopefully we will hear back that um, we have been refunded. Um, what else? Um, I was supposed to be on vacation next, or next, not next week, but the week after, the last week in July, but um, we're doing a program and I'll need to um, be involved with that um, some, so um, I won't totally be on vacation next week um but it's it's okay um i was planning on going to connecticut for the week to um, hang out with um, a friend there um i'm not going to be able to do that but i did finish that night shift shawl that i was working on um i'll tell you more about that in fo's um and put that in the mail to her this week um, and I know that she will uh, really like it and appreciate it. So did that. Um, my Mabe sweater class is done. The sweater is not. <laughs> I'll tell you more about that when we get to knitting content. Um, but um, my knitting teacher actually went on a cruise and she uh, got to stop in Amsterdam she made it to Stephen West's uh, yarn shop there, Stephen and Penelope. And um, I asked her if she got a chance to go there, if she could get me the Painting Shawls book. And she said she did. So I'm really excited to see her and hear about her trip and um, check out that book. So um, I'll, I'll have to show you that on the next uh, podcast. Um, so that's pretty exciting. And then on the 4th, uh, for the 4th of July, like weekend, weekend, my sister, my oldest sister was in town. Her name is Nicole. Um, she lives in California, but she came into town because she um, owns the house that my mother lives in. My mother and my, uh, one of my younger sisters, Veronica, um, she decided to sell that house because it it was big. We actually called it the big house. Um, it's like 3,600 square feet. It's got a three car garage. Um, really, really big house, old home too, but it's just getting a little too much for my mother. So she sold it. It sold like a lot of houses pretty quickly. <laughs> so, um, she actually bought another smaller house for my mom to move into. So that move, um, 
happened. She came into town to like wrap up some things with the house and with the new house. Um, so like she had new carpet put in, um, and just doing some things like, you know, all the stuff that you have to do when you, uh, purchase a new home. Um, but my mom is selling in there. It was really nice to see her because I hadn't seen her face to face since the pandemic started. I usually go there. Um, I, I try to go there about once a year, um, pre pandemic times and she comes home usually at least once a year. So we usually see each other a couple times a year, but that has not happened since the pandemic. Um, but it was really um, nice. Um, she got to hear me preach because I was asked to preach on 4th of July weekend um, because uh, a pastor was going to be out of town with his family. Um, so that was really um, nice. Um, and um, we also uh, drove up to Oberlin. Um, uh, she is, my sister is an Oberlin alum. And whenever she comes into town, she likes to try and get up there just to visit, see the campus and things like that. And um, the uh, Historical Society was doing um, a civil rights walking tour. So we went up and did that tour. It was really interesting. Learned a lot of uh, cool history about um, Oberlin. And then we went to visit uh, For You, Lisa's Yarn Shop, which I have highlighted on this podcast before. Um, and that was really um, nice. My sister is a crocheter. Um, I think I've mentioned on this channel before that um, we started crocheting. Our aunt taught us to crochet when we were really little. Um, and my sister has continued to crochet. Um, you know, I expanded to knitting. Um, but, um, so we, um, when we went to Lisa's shop, um, you know, she got to connect with Lisa, who was also an Oberlin alum. Um, and um, we talked about some uh, other things and she got some uh, goodies and I'll tell you about those um, later. But that was a fun uh, uh, time um, just to hang out with her and also to see Lisa um, again. If you haven't made it to For You and you live in Northeast Ohio, you got to go. Um, you will not be disappointed. Um, I also got to start my summer concert season. Um, a friend and I get summer season tickets for the Cleveland Orchestra. They do concerts um, at this outdoor pavilion. Um, it's called Blossom Music Center. Um, and um, we buy what's called a lawn book. It's just a, it's a book of 10, uh, lawn seat tickets. Um, and, um, so we split that lawn book. Um, and, um, it's one of my favorite things in the summer because for these concerts, um, you can bring in food and wine and beer. Um, and so we, um, we, you know, figure out, uh, you know, every time we have a concert coming up, you know, who's going to bring what, and we bring our blankets and our um, uh, lawn chairs um, and just, you know, listen to some good music and um, eat some good food, have some good wine. And um, it's a lot, a lot of fun. So last weekend was um, Paul Simon music. So the orchestra played a lot of kind of hits of Paul Simon and they had these three vocalists who were um, singing. Um, that was good. Um, and next weekend is Lord of the Rings. So I'm really looking forward to, the, to that. I think it's going to be fantastic. So the orchestra is going to be playing the um, soundtrack while the movie is playing. And we've been to other concerts like that. They've done um, 
like Harry Potter and um, uh, different Star Wars movies. Really, really great uh, stuff. Um, it's just so cool to see the orchestra um, playing through a whole movie. It's really, really cool. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. So like I said, next weekend is Lord of the Rings. They're going to be doing a Harry Potter movie later in the summer. Um, they're going to be doing a Broadway show. Um, Sound of Music they're going to do. That's going to be great. It's just, it's a great time. I really love it. Um, so, um, do you have any favorite summertime activities? Let me know in the, uh, comments, um, uh, what you like to do. Um, one of my other kind of favorite things to do in the summer is to visit our county fair. Um, my kids did 4-H, um, basically from the time they were old enough to do 4-H until they aged out. Um, they did horses primarily, um, and, um, our county fair is always the last week in July. And, um, because they did horses, when you have a horse at our county fair, you have to, uh, camp on the fairgrounds because they want you to be there in case something happens with your horse. Um, and so... We spent many years, we would borrow a pop-up from somebody at our church and we'd be camping all week at the fairgrounds. It was a lot of fun, even though it was exhausting. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Um, but um, because of that, um, my son and I usually um, go to the fair at least one day um, and hang out eat some good fair food, which is one of the best things about fair, the fair food. Oh my gosh. Um, and we'll watch some of the horse classes and walk around the barns. It's not very different from a, a fiber festival, actually. Um, but it's just, um, it's a lot of fun. So um, we'll definitely do uh, that. Um uh, my husband and I are actually already planning, speaking of fiber festivals, to be at the wool gathering in Yellow Springs, um, which is in September. Are any of you planning on going to the wool gathering? Let me know in the comments. Um, we will be there on Saturday. Um, um, we're we're going to drive down on Friday evening. Um and um, hang out in the Dayton area. Um, my husband actually went to college um, in Dayton. He went to Wright State. Um, so we'll be hanging out in Dayton. And then on the way back, we'll stop in Columbus because there's lots of fun stuff to do there too. Um, but um, let me know in the comments if you're planning on going to Yellow Springs. I'd love to meet... Um, you, um, if you're there. Um, but, um, what I thought I would do since my, um, husband, um, is from Dayton, I thought that I would have him share some ideas about things to do in the Dayton area. So here is an interview with Mr. Black Knitter. So I thought I would bring uh, Mr. Black Knitter on because he's a native of Dayton. He used to live there. And he went to college there. Does that mean I'm a native? I guess. I, I didn't, think so. I'm not from there, but I lived there for a while. So. Yes. He says he's from Columbus. It's true. But he grew up mostly in Dayton. 50-50. Oh. Okay. All right, so first I want to explain his t-shirt. This is actually uh, from the Rosa Parks Museum in um, Montgomery. And this is um, the number that they put on her when they arrested her. So that's what that means, in case you're wondering. Um, okay, so my first question, Mr. Black Knitter, is who's on your lap? This is Jet. Uh, Jet is Jet is our 
one of our dogs. Uh, he is a four-year-old Yorkie. So, he's, you all know Nico. You've seen Nico. This is this Jet. This is our, our other doggy son. And he's here because he's obsessed with me. So, that's why he's sitting on my lap. Yeah, that's his dog. Um, okay, so, you went to the wool gathering with me last year. I did. What would you think about it? It was very interesting. Interesting, how? Well, it was uh, interesting to see how they shear the sheep to mm -hmm. get the wool. That part was pretty cool. I was amazed at how much wool one sheep produces um, and how fast they did it. That was kind of freaky because they just took those shears and just and it was gone. And it was just big old piles of wool. That was pretty cool. Um, it was nice seeing all the vendors um, from all over the state as well as out of, as well as out of state. So that was kind of cool, too. Okay. How do you think it compared to the the Great Lakes Fiber Show that we went to? Hmm. Um. I think it was. I don't know. I think it was similar. I don't know. I feel like the event in Yellow Springs seemed to be bigger. I don't know if that was my imagination. It seemed like there was more going on. I don't think there were more vendors. Not more vendors, but it just seemed like, I don't know. There were a lot more vendors at Great Lakes than at Wool Gathering. Right. And it wasn't as hot either. That's true. It was hot at last year, Wool Gathering. Yeah, but I think there is more to do at the Wool Gathering just because of where it's right. Right. at. Um, so it's at this dairy place. In Yellow Springs. Young's Jersey Dairy. It's in a field across from their their facility. A famous uh, local location to get the best ice cream in the area. So, you have been there before. Yes. And what's fun to do at Young's Dairy? Well, obviously they have a um, they have a renovated uh, shop now, and you can get. All kinds of food and ice cream. Um, they've added, it seems like they've added since I used to live there, attractions. There's like, uh, I think there's like mini golf and some other outdoor uh, type attractions, um, which is pretty cool as well. So, so you could definitely pretty spend it. Family there. friendly. Very family friendly. And really good ice cream. It's very good <laughs> ice cream, I must say. You don't want to miss out on the ice cream. Um, are there other things to do in the Dayton area that you would recommend? Uh, yes, I would say uh, probably going to see some of the local universities and colleges. Obviously, Yellow Springs is right down the road, so that's a very famous uh, school. Or not Yellow Springs, but um, um, Antioch College. Or Antio Is it Antioch University? College? It's university? college. Well, I don't know. They don't change, remember. so I don't know, but, you know, there's local Yellow Springs with the downtown. I think last year there was a some sort of event going on at the same time. There was time. a porch rocker event at the same time as yeah. school gathering. Um, so I think if that's happening the same weekend, we should check that out a little yes, more. Yes, I think that would be fun. Um, you could check out University of Dayton, which is in uh, Dayton itself, the Dayton proper downtown. Go to Wright State University, which is uh, my, uh, my claim to fame. That's where I got my undergrad degree from. His uh, alma mater. My alma mater. So um, that would be good to go to. Um, I think some other things that would be good to go to, depending on what you're into, is the Dayton Art Institute. Uh, they have one of the largest American art collections in the country. Uh, I've been there a few times, so that's if you're interested in the Dayton Art Institute. Um, one of the newer attractions that was not there when I lived there is the Aviation Museum or Aviation Park and Museum. And that has to do with the Wright brothers, who obviously flew the first plane in the early oh, 1900s. So I didn't think about that. you can see their bicycle shop where they had the bicycle shop, and there's like a museum. And um, although the website reviews were a little weird, it looks like their hours were kind of funky. So like hmm. people would show up and they were closed. So I would double check that. Um, I also would definitely highly recommend the Air Force Museum at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which is right near Wright State. Um, not only is it really cool if you're into aviation and airplanes and the Air Force and military, but it's free parking and free admission. 
and they're open nine to five, seven days a week. So <laughs> where else can you go anywhere free nowadays? So yeah. So, so the, he's into history and museums. I am. Stuff like that, I, I'm so. a museum nerd. I, I like to go to museums. I could do a whole podcast just on museums. Hmm. Hmm. Podcast ideas. There we go. What do you know? But I think the last thing I'd say too is uh, off of Patter. I think Patterson Boulevard in downtown Dayton is the Carillon Bell Tower, and that is uh, the Deeds Carillon. It's a giant bell tower um, that was was erected, and it's like there's a whole historical park there. Um, you can't miss it. It's huge. So that's another, I think, a touristy attraction you could go to while you're in the area. So that would be some of the places I would say. All right. We're not going to have time to see all We're that. not. We're, We're not. Decide. We're going to have to see, decide. Yeah, there's too much to do. There's other things to do, but those are some that, that come to mind. I mean, it depends on how nerdy you get. There's the, like, Paul Lawrence Dunbar house, if the poet. Um, I would Famous like to see black that. poet. Yeah, that was... That was uh, his house is there, and then I think the um, the Patterson homestead because Patterson family was was big in the Dayton area, so you can see that as well. All right, so there's lots to do. Um, so so come um, to Dayton if you're thinking about the wool gathering. Um, there's lots to do in the the area, so think about it. Check it out. Yeah, hope to see you there. See you in September. Yep. September. So what's the date again? Can you tell everyone, just remind everyone the date and times? Uh, I don't have You it. don't have the date and times? I think I it's September 11th and 12th, if I'm not mistaken. I can't remember. It's like mid-September, so fingers I'll crossed it'll be cooler it, I'll this drop year. it here. You'll still drop it here. So you know. Or here. I don't know how that works. So It'll be on the screen somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mr. Black Knitter. Thanks, everyone. See ya. Bye. Okay, so I hope you um, enjoyed that. Um, one thing that it made me think about is that it might be fun to do a Q&A episode. Um, maybe I'll even do it live, I don't know. Um, but um, I've decided to create a Google Doc where you can put um, any questions you have for me um, and that'll be in the um, description box. Um, so check that out, um, and I'll try to answer whatever questions you have. You can ask questions about me or about race or about beloved community, whatever it's on your heart to, um, ask, um, and I will try to answer. So, um, so yeah, um, and I haven't decided when I'm going to do that, um, but I'll, I'll probably just leave that document open so that, you know, whenever people think about a question, they can put it there. Um, all right. So I think that is it for um, Abari Ghani. Um, so let's go into some education. Um, Elimu is what we call that in Swahili. Um, I just want to uh, put a reminder here about what Beloved Community is, in case you're new or you don't know. Um, what does that mean? It means that uh, it, it's a community where the love of God operates in the human heart. I've said that before. That's how Dr. Um, King described it. Um and um, a beloved community um, produces fruit of justice and belonging and community and accountability. That means that if we're in a beloved community, we're concerned about equity, um, that we want every member of our community to feel like they really belong um, and that they are embraced. Um, and it also means that we hold each other accountable for the way that we treat each other. So if, if I see that you are behaving in a way that is um, inconsistent with beloved community, I need to let you know that. 
and you need to receive that. Okay. So if you're not willing to be held accountable, <laughs> then this probably isn't the place for you <laughs> because that that's part of the process, right? And that's how we, um, grow together. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm going to do that in a way that is harmful to you because again, being part of beloved community means that we believe that everybody is valuable, that everybody has worth. And so I am going to love you like I love me. And I really love me. So when I say I'm going to hold you accountable, I'm going to do that in love for you because I love you and I love me. Okay. Um, and if I ever see a comment, um, on my videos that I think is inconsistent with, um, beloved community, I will delete them. Simple as that. I'm not going to engage in conversation about it. The comment will just disappear. <laughs> just so you know. Um, so this week I wanted to talk about, um, history because history has been under attack y'all. Um, I preached about it a couple of weeks ago. Um, I did a little devotion on it on my Sunday school channel. I'll link, uh, my Sunday school channel below for those of you who are interested in checking that out. Um, there are a lot of people who do not want us to learn the history of the U S because it makes people feel bad. Um, Florida is one of those places where history is really under attack. Um, they have a now, they have a law now, um, that's really interesting. This is what it says. It's, um, uh, house bill seven, that they have voted into law. It says it protects civil rights and employment and K through 12 education by specifying that subjecting an employee or student to a required activity that promotes advances or compels individuals to believe discriminatory, discriminatory concepts constitutes unlawful discrimination concepts const constituting unlawful discrimination include that members of one race, color, national origin, or sex are morally superior to members of another race, color, national origin, or sex. Sounds okay, right? A person by virtue of their race or sex is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive. Okay, that's getting a little questionable. Um, a person's moral character or status as privileged or oppressed is determined by race, color, national origin, or sex. Okay. Moral character is one thing. Privilege is another. <laughs> it's a little problematic, y'all. Um, a person by virtue of their race, color, national origin, or sex should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment to achieve diversity, equity, or inclusion. Um, and so th that's a nice way of saying reverse discrimination is not allowed and reverse discrimination is not a thing. Just so you know, it's not a thing. It's not a thing. Um, and I think I'll talk about that in a future episode right now. I want to talk about, um, history, but we, I'm going to put that on the list for, um, a future episode. It says the bill also requires instruction, instructional materials, and professional development in public schools to adhere to principles of individual freedom outlined in the bill. Those principles include that no person is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive just by virtue of his or her race or sex. Um, and meritocracy or hard work ethic are not racist, but fundamental to the right to pursue success. ridiculous. Um, so, um, uh, I don't think I've ever heard somebody say that meritocracy or hard work is racist. 
um, I think what we have done in the United States, which you can see if you look at history, um, is kind people into believing that all it takes is hard work. Um, and if you work hard, that work will be rewarded. That's what a meritocracy is all about. Hard work is rewarded. Um, when that is clearly not the case, if you look at data, um, it takes more than hard work. It takes a particular position in our stratified society. And our society is stratified by all of these categories that they keep mentioning in this law, race, um, national origin, because people from other countries are discriminated against, um, gender <laughs> and uh, sexual orientation. Those are all things that um, determine your position in our society and your position shapes your lived experience. So um, now all of this might seem like, well, okay, but does it really affect anything? Well, yes, it does. This law actually, um, because it's been um, enacted in Florida, now has prompted at least one university in Florida, University of Central Florida, to compel departments to remove diversity statements from their websites. Um, so here's an example. Um, University of Florida removed diversity statements from a number of departmental websites. One was for the philosophy department and their statement said this, we acknowledge the key place of the university as a site of struggle for social justice and are committed to addressing the problem of anti-blackness, white supremacy, and all forms of implicit and explicit racism in our professions, wherever we find it, even if it's in our own department. They had to remove that. So it's already having a, um, an effect. Basically, the law says that if it's something that makes white, white people feel bad about being white, then it can't be taught. And in this case, you can't even say it like on a website. So let's talk about this for a minute. We need to understand all of our history, not just the parts that make us feel good. This is biblical. God instructed the Jewish people to teach their history to their children. It's in Psalm 78 if you want to look it up. So I had to take a quick break because I heard Nico walking around. So I had to let him out, give him some water. Say hi, Nico. Say hi to the people. <laughs> I'm going to see if he'll relax right here. I might have to put him down if he does not. All right, so I was talking about Psalm 78. Look it up. It's all about um, history. It says that um, the history that they would teach was both good and bad. That it wouldn't be easy to hear. That it contained some dark times some dark things God wanted the people to know this history because guess what you can learn from other people's mistakes you can learn from the history that um, uh, that that you hear um, God didn't want the people to repeat their um, ancestors mistakes so he instructed them to teach what had happened before. Um, and um, uh, the, the same kind of thing happens in the book of uh, Nehemiah. I think it's chapter six. He's getting impatient with me. Um, so in Nehemiah, once they... 
uh, we're finished rebuilding the wall um, and this basically the city because the city was in a shambles. Um, the priests recited the entire history. In Psalms, that Psalm, in Psalm 78, that Psalm is really long because they're recounting the history of the people from um, their time in Egypt as slaves up to the current day, which at the time the Psalm was written was the, uh, during the reign of King David. So it's, it's a long history, but they wanted people to learn it all, the good and the bad. And you know, here's the other thing. It's only in autocratic dictatorial societies where they have outlawed teaching the complete history of a particular people or place. People like Hitler and Mussolini in dictatorships, um, the state controls what is taught because they want to control how people view the world and their place in it. When we examine history, we can see how we might be going in a direction that is too reminiscent of the past. History serves another purpose though. It reminds us of who we are and whose we are. Um, you know, the book of Nehemiah um, emphasizes this idea that the people had forgotten that they belong to God. So Nehemiah says, hey, priests, Levites, I need y'all to read the entire history, um, much like they do in Psalm 78. This reminds the people that even though they forgot that they belong to God, God never forgot them. Um, God was always with them. God always forgave them. God always delivered them. Learning the full history of our nation reminds us of who we are. You know, it reminds us that it took all of us to build this country. It's composed of the contributions of all of us, First Nations people or Indigenous people, African people, Mexican people, people from all over Europe, people from Asia, China, Japan, right? All of us. Our history reminds us that um, we've made some missteps along the way. <laughs> and that we don't want to repeat those missteps. You know, and it also teaches us that um, the wealthy used to actually care about distributing their wealth so that all of us could experience what President Obama calls the promised land. Um, so for example, in the 50s and 60s, the wealthiest Americans paid much more in taxes because they were taxed on not only their earned income, which all Americans are taxed on, but also money that they got from corporate and estate earnings, which is where most of their wealth actually comes from, the corporate and estate side, not earned income, because most wealthy person aren't like working jobs. Um, so earned income taxes are progressive. That means that the more money you earn from working, the more you pay. That's what most Americans do. So me and my husband's combined income is pretty high. So we pay more than somebody who's making less than we do, right? Corporate and estate taxes have gone way, way down since the 50s and 60s. Um, they really went down 
during the Reagan administration. So what that means is that when you look at total taxes, when you look at federal taxes, state taxes, local taxes, corporate taxes, estate taxes, the wealthiest 5% of Americans don't pay much more than upper middle class Americans like me. Um, they only pay about 4% more than people like me. People who are in the, you know, 113,000 to 252,000 uh, dollar bracket pay about 29% of their total income in taxes. People who make like 252,000 up to 615, um, those people pay about 31% um, of their total income in taxes. The wealthiest Americans, those people who are in that six, 615,000 and up bracket, they're paying about 34% of their total income um, or their total, their total, yeah, their total income in uh, taxes. Again, that's only about a 4% difference from people like me. Um, so they get to keep a lot more of their money in their pockets, right? That's why their um, wealth multiplies so quickly because they're keeping most of what they earn. Um, it's accumulating more interest, right? Um, and that just adds to their wealth, right? Um, it's a crazy, crazy system. And it's things like this. This is exactly why you see people who have power today trying to limit what we learn and teach. Um, they don't want us to be critical of what they're doing. Um, they don't want us to understand, for example, the history of taxation in this nation, because then more people would question, well, why aren't we taxing these other kinds of uh, sources of income that wealthier Americans have, like we were in the past? Why aren't we doing that, right? Um, they don't want us to question these decisions. They don't want us to hold them accountable. And they're using things, um, you know, we call them wedge issues, things like racism, critical race theory, how that became a wedge issue. I don't know. I do know, but, <laughs> um, but they're using things like that, reproductive rights, um, the rights of LGBTQIA plus people, all those things, they're using those things to, one, keep us distracted, um, to keep us fighting with each other, um, and two, so that they can consolidate their power. They're using these kinds of issues to rally people who typically don't vote so they can get their vote and consolidate their power. And not really, you know, those people don't understand that um, they're not doing anything to help them. They're not. They're actually trying to take away things that would help those people who are like really rallying behind them. Um, <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever read The Handmaid's Tale, but um, that story it's so reminiscent of what's happening now. Um, you know, The Handmaid's Tale is all about how a, a really conservative religious group overthrew the U.S. government. Like they had, like they, they used a revolution because they rallied some people. <laughs> um, and took over the U.S government and instituted this new government that was a 
theocracy. Um, and <laughs> so religion was used as a front for maintaining power and um, subjugating people. Um, that's what we're seeing right now, right? And y'all, I don't want to be Martha. I don't want to be a Martha like in The Handmaid's Tale because that's what I would be in a society like that. I would be a Martha. Um, and we have the power to stop this from happening. We can't let this happen. So I need all y'all to start talking to your family, talking to your friends, anybody who will listen, that they need to vote. They need to vote because our lives depend on it. Not like our lives depend, our lives depend on it. These decisions that the Supreme Court is making are reversing rights for people. Um, for example, my husband is really concerned that there will be some states who actually outlaw interracial marriage. <laughs> in Ohio, there's actually a bill in Ohio that a senator is trying to pass right now that would do that. And Ohio is where I live, y'all. So um, we need to fight back. And one of the most powerful ways to fight back is to vote. They're counting on too many of us being apathetic or um, uh, bowing out of the democratic process so that they can just take over. I don't want them to do that. I don't want them to have that power. So get out there. Get out there. Talk to people. Tell them to vote, please. Um, our lives literally depend on it. All right, let's get into some knitting content. I hope you have something to drink. I'm just drinking coffee. My husband and I were talking about going out to a winery this afternoon, but looks like it's gonna be storming all afternoon. The sky is getting pretty dark. So I think we'll be stuck at home today, which is fine. It's fine. All right. It's Kumba time. Creativity. Let's talk about some knitting. Um, so let's talk first about um, what I'm working on. Some finished objects. I have one finished object. I don't have it here. Um, because... I already put it in the mail, as I said earlier. Um, so I finished my night shift shawl that I was working on. I will insert a picture of the finished object somewhere here so you can see that. Um, Y'all, that shawl came out so, so nice. That jewel spun um, gradient, um, those two colors I used, um, Glacier and Nordic Noir. Um, they worked so well together. I love, love, love the way that that shawl came out. So you got to check out the Night Shift Shawl by um, Andrea Mowry. Um, it's something that knits up really fast because it uses worsted weight yarn, um, which I love. <laughs> I love projects that um, take less time. Um, but, um, yeah, it, it came out really good as you can see from the picture. Um, so that was my only finished object, but it is in the mail. Uh, my friend's birthday is actually next weekend, so she'll get that this week. Um, and I'm really excited, um, to, um, hear how she likes it. Um, so works in progress progress whips um i've got um a couple so i will start with my um my not too tart hats if you recall from the last episode i had started another one um i actually ended up frogging it because um 
that Mace of Skeins yarn that I was using, which I love the color of, um, and I got to figure out what I'm going to make with it because it's got some sparkle in it. Um, it ended up just being too thick. Um, so I frogged it and started over with some scraps that I um, have left over from actually my shawlography um, project. Um, so all of these yarns, I'll show them. So um, this one is a metal and tosh. I can't remember the colorway. If I remember, I'll put it in the show notes. Um, this one is a Mace of Skeins colorway. It is, I think this is Love Potion number nine, maybe. Um, so nice purple. Um, and then this one, I can't remember the name of it, this yellow. Um, uh, yellow is the new something. This is from uh, Passion Knits Yarn. Love her um, yarns. She has some really vibrant um, colors. Um, and she put together that great Kwanzaa um, advent that really kind of started this whole podcast. Um, so yeah, isn't that nice? Nice yellow. Um, and then I started it with the leftover Mandalorian color from my little mini set from Superfine Yarn Co. Um, so this is where I'm at. Not very far since I frogged it. But making progress. So again, I love this. I said in the last podcast that it's really kind of meditative knitting for me. It allows me to really um, think and pray um, because it's a, it's a simple, um, pattern that's really easy to memorize. Um, so it's been really good for that. And, um, I've been doing some, uh, writing for work, um, that's, um, based on some research that I've been doing with some colleagues. And so it's really helped me, um, you know, kind of when I get blocked on, you know, thoughts, um, you know, part of writing research is thinking about all the things that people have done before on that particular topic and thinking about how that fits into the story that you're trying to tell based on the data that you have. Um, that, that for me is, um, challenging. Um, so having something that helps me keep my hands busy and can help me kind of get into that flow of just thinking through ideas. This has been really helpful and I'm keeping it in my, uh, Mandalorian little bag that I got from for you. Um, love this little bag. It's a perfect size for that. Um, I still have not picked up my waffle. Uh, you can see it's sitting in the, the bag right there, right there. It's sitting there. Haven't done anything with that. I also have not done anything with my hitchhiker shawl. That's just been sitting, sitting, sitting. Um, uh, but I, you know, love that waffle. Every time I think about it, I'm like, I really want to pick it back up um, and finish it. But I want to get some of these other things done. Um, you know, because a couple of things I'm doing for uh, birthdays that are coming up. So, um, let me tell you about the, um, the other birthday project that I'm working on. I have this in my broke and crafty bag. She will be linked below. Um, this has my Mabe sweater in it and oops, it looks like, I hope this doesn't come off the needles. 
Um, oh, I've got an extra needle in there. All right, so I haven't made a whole lot of progress on this. Um, because I've been, because I've been working on that paper, I've been just using my not too tart hat to think. Um, so it's, I've gotten a little further than I was the last time. So I am almost done with the lace portion. Um, and see what the lace looks like. They're like little flowers. Isn't that pretty? Still loving this color. I think my cousin will really like it. Her birthday's not until September, so I've got time to finish it. And I'm actually contemplating making this a dress. So just, um, I think I might just keep knitting until it's long enough to be like a above the knee dress. We'll see. Um, I've got quite a bit of yarn in here, so I think I can manage that. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. I think it would look really cute on her. We'll see. Um, and I am uh, also uh, still working on my painted honeycombs shawl and I'm not saying a whole lot about the yarns because I've talked about them before so check out those previous episodes I'll also link all of the yarns in the show notes um, so you can check there um, but painted honeycombs this is made with um, the colorway that um, John made for me over at a Lefty Nitty, left, Lefty Knitter Podcast. Um, and I'm in the middle of a row. I know that's not what you're supposed to do for a podcast, but it is what it is, y'all. I'm not a professional. Um, so this is getting pretty wide. Um, really love it. Give me a close up there. Still love it. Can't wait to finish it and block it. It's going to be great. And this is from me. Ain't nobody getting this but me. Okay. Um, but I love this pattern. It's really um, easy. Um, I can't wait to get that painting shawls book because um, it's really uh, kind of inspired me to um, check out or, or work on some of the other um, painting shawls that Stephen West um, has, like painting bricks and things. So, um, so yeah, that's fun. And this is living in a bag that I got in my Chicken Coop Dye Works Kwanzaa um, box. I really like it. This is a good size bag. So really love that. Um, and let me grab the sweater. I have a bunch of stuff piled up back here, as you can see. <laughs> I need to clean up my office here. But, um, so this is the sweater that I'm working on for my son. And let me see. Um, so my progress keepers are down here. I don't know if I was actually only that far the last time I showed this, but these sleeves are pretty long now. They are long enough that I am at the point where I, um, have started, uh, the decreases for the shoulder. So without giving too much because that is a paid for pattern. Um, it's got, um, the, um, decreases are going to go far enough that the sleeve actually 
like attaches up here. Um, so it's really, um, it's going to look cool. Um, but so I've just started the decreases for, um, the shoulder. So making good progress on that again, that's a project that requires a lot of concentration. So I can't really be doing anything else when I'm working on it. Um, or I mess up the cables. <laughs> so, um, I, um, will, um, just keep working on that. Excuse me. I've got lots of time to finish it. It'll be a while before it's cold enough again for him to wear it. So, so, but love the pattern. It's really well written pattern. Um, really easy to follow. Um, so, and taking the Mabe class really helped me um, understand the charts better. Um, and um, it's also helped me with this new cast on that I have. Um, you know, everything that I've shown you, um, you've seen before. Um, and I actually um, started a new cast on that I was actually holding off on because I really wanted to understand chart reading better. So now that I do, um, I started something new and I've got it in my, um, oh, what is this maker? Allegheny Fiber Arts, I think is the name. Uh, met this maker at Great Lakes Fiber Show. Um, and love this material because it's doggies. Love doggies. And these are small doggies, which is cool. Um, so I am doing, um, let's see if I can show you the front of the, I don't usually print out patterns, but this one I did because it's charted. But this is the Film Real Socks. There's the picture. And um, this is a pattern by Alex Parker Mooney. Um, she is known as Left Sock Best Sock on Instagram. Um, I will link her below. But I found out about this pattern from uh, Cinematic Skein. So thanks for mentioning that um, because my husband, Mr. Black Knitter, um, loves movies. Um, I mean, really loves movies. Like, it's like his favorite thing. Um, he knows a lot about movies. So when I saw this pattern, I was like, I gotta make these socks. And I had purchased some yarn. It's probably been, uh, a year, almost a year ago now, from Marionated Yarns. She had several Star Wars colorways and my husband and son love Star Wars. Um, so I had to get this um, uh, sock yarn um, and I had it, um, I got it and I skeined it up. So it was in two balls. I was ready to make him a pair of socks. I was just, you know, waiting to clear some other things off the needles. And, you know, before you know it, one thing is, you know, one thing and another, and it's almost a year later and you still haven't cast on a project. But I saw this pattern and I was like, okay, it's time. So, you know, things always work out for the best, right? The universe was waiting for the time when I would become aware of this pattern. So it provided the perfect opportunity to start these socks. So look at that, y'all. Isn't that cool? So I am doing two at a time, cuff down. I usually, when I make socks, I do toe up two at a time. 
because I don't want to have to worry about running out of yarn <laughs> before I get to the, you know, to the toe. Um, but, um, this pattern is cuffed down and it's fine. Um, usually when I make him a crew length pair of socks, I've got plenty of yarn, so I'm not worried about running out. Um, so this blue is the marinated yarns colorway. It's called Toth, which is, a um, uh, inspired by Star Wars. Um, something in Star Wars. My husband can tell you what Toth is referencing. I can't. Um, and then I got some nitpick stroll in bare and black uh, to do the um, film film reel. Isn't that cool? Really like the way it's turning out so far. Um, so there's two things about this. Pattern is great. No problems with the pattern. Um, my, uh, floats are a little snug. I'm hoping that will block out. But, um, as I move into this second repeat of the color work pattern, I'm going to try and loosen up, uh, those floats some. Um, so that's a little bit of a concern, but I'm hoping that I will be able to fix that. I'm not taking this out. The other thing is because I'm doing them two at a time um, and I've got three colors on each sock, so that's six strands of yarn. And that has been really difficult to manage to keep them, you know, untangled. So if you have any ideas about how to do that, I posted something on Instagram about it and people had some really good ideas. Um, but, um, none of them have helped so far with keeping them from like getting all wrapped up around each other. So I might have to resort to just putting them on two separate needles and not doing two at a time or just doing them in tandem instead of having them on the same set of needles, which is fine. I've done that before, but it's just easier for me to do them on the same needle. So um, that keeps me in the same place on both socks. So we'll see. Let me know if you have some ideas about how to manage that. So those are all of the works in progress that I have right now. Um, I want to show you the things that I bought um, from Lisa. And I also have a purchase from Whitney Marie Anderson. Um, let me show you that first because I love it. I bought, um, you should follow her on Instagram. Um, she's been posting some cute stuff. Um, but um, I got a progress keeper from her. Look at that. Isn't that cute? Um, I got this because, you know, it's a little girl with Afro puffs. It reminded me of my daughter when she was little. So, um, it's just so lovely. So that was a purchase. Um, the only other purchase I made was from For You. I'm just looking back here to make sure that that is indeed true. <laughs> it is. That's the only purchase I've made. So um, for my sister, um, she got um, three or four skeins of yarn, um, including um, some red and white because she is uh, a member of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority. Um, and, uh, and some cro a set of crochet hooks, um, a little pair of scissors. I think that was it. Um, 
but it's interesting. So I told you she is a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. I am a member, I think I've said it before, of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. There's a painting back here in the corner. Um, but um, while we were at For You, uh, my sister Lisa and I were talking about, um, you know, uh, getting colors of yarns appropriate for our sororities. So you can see the colors for Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated are royal blue and white. Uh, the deltas um, are uh, uh, red and white or crimson and cream, I believe is officially what their colors are. Um, but um, D9 organizations, in case you don't know, are historically black Greek letter organizations, fraternities, and sororities, all of which were founded. It's called D9 because it's nine organizations. Most of them were founded in the um, early 1900s um, because black people were barred from joining white fraternities and sororities. So they created their own. Um, and these organizations aren't exclusive to black people. I have um, uh, sorority sisters all over the world um, who are black, white, Hispanic, Asian, from all walks of life. Um, but that was the history. So they are predominantly black um, organizations. Um, but we were talking about um, how um, uh, how we could use various yarns in Lisa's shop to make items for um, our uh, sorority, for sorority functions and things. Um, and um, we ended up having, um, after that, after we left, um, Lisa actually tagged me in a post on Instagram where she had curated um, some kits, if you will, um, that were D9 kits. So she posted photos of um, combinations of yarn that she had in the shop that you could use to make um, an item for um, uh, people who you know who are in these different uh, fraternities and sororities, which was really cool. <laughs> I thought that was fantastic. So if you know someone who is in a D9 organization or if you are in a D9 organization and you want to uh, create something um, for uh, that organization, check out um, Lisa's Instagram post. Um, but also you can just reach out to her um, you can send her a message through her website or on Instagram and let her know, you know, I, I want to, to put together an item for this particular organization and she'll help you um, do that. I thought that was fantastic. So one of the things that I bought when I was at her shop was Royal Blue. Isn't that fantastic? This is like the perfect Zeta blue. Um, it actually, um, I don't know if it, it looks more purple on camera, but it's, it's actually royal blue. Love this color. And this is 60% um, superwash merino, 25% Surrey alpaca, 15% nylon. It's a fingering weight. It's pretty light fingering, 497 yards from Perennial is the label. Hopefully you can see that. Um, feels really nice. Um, so I'm going to make something really nice with this that I can wear to a sorority meeting. So looking forward to that. Um, I'll just leave this over here. Um, and then um, I also got, um, if you remember, I made a top for my daughter. Um, it was a test knit um, of a nice yellow top 
Um, and I made that with bamboo pop. You know, she lives in Florida where it's really hot. Um, so I actually got some more bamboo pop um, in these colors that go nicely together because she asked me to make her, what she would really like is the top that I made her in a dress. Um, so um, I've got another couple of balls of this purple and I'm gonna try to combine it some kind of way with this um, white that has the purple color in it so those goes really well together um, I'm gonna try and combine that in uh, a dress of some type for her if I can't get a dress out of it I'll just I don't know maybe I'll make her a tank top or something I'll figure it out but that's what that's for um, I've purchased some Wonderland yarns from Lisa before um, she has some silk in her shop so this is 100% um, silk boret I think that's how you say that um, and I got this because um, for black hair um, you, you, fibers can um, really damage your hair. Um, so um, silk and satin are fibers that can um, prevent that from happening. So I want to make a hat that has um, a silk um, base so that it really protects um, my hair instead of breaking it off. Um, so that's what this is going to be used for. It's going to be used for a hat. Um, and then I got some more Wonderland um, yarns just because I love the way it feels. Um, I have some of this same colorway in sport weight, but this is it. It's called Queen of Hearts in um, fingering weight. This is MCN, which is, y'all, you know. I love that MCN, right? So, <laughs> and to get some of this, this is actually called uh, Tea Time Earl Grey, number 156 is the color. Um, and the base is Queen of Hearts, but um, yeah, MCN, y'all. It's my favorite. Um, and I also got this Wonderland yarn. Um, this is the Mad Hatter base. It is a sport weight. That's the, that's the one that I have um, already. This is 100% um, Superwash Merino. And this is called uh, um, Number 5, An All Night Diner in the Middle of Nowhere. That's such a good name for this. So I just, I love the color um i think this will make a really nice um shawl um with a nice bit of color in it so um uh yeah if you have any recommendations for one skein shawls that would really show this off let me know in the comments um uh i just really love this so had to get that so that was that was all of my purchases from uh, Lisa um, at For You. So that's uh, that's my uh, Ujamaa segment, Cooperative Economics. I did a lot of uh, Cooperative Economics. Um, so that is it. That is all I have. So I will see you next time. Make sure you submit some questions for the Q&A. Um, let me know if you think I should do it live or if I should just record it and post it. I mean, if, if I do it live, it's going to be posted. But um, let me know if you'd like a live. Um, and um, uh, what else can I tell you? I think that's it. Um, I will try and do another episode in a couple of weeks. Um, but like I said earlier, um, I'm getting busier, not 
Let's so, so we'll see what happens. I'm going to try my best. Um, in the meantime, uh, practice beloved community wherever you are. I will see you next time. Not Habari Ghani. Asante sana. See you later.